Our study of number theory has discovered two classes of computational problems that we could call easy and hard. Easy are ones for which we have fast, efficient algorithms. And these are things like modular exponentiation, modular inverse, extended GCD, but also basic things like addition and multiplication and uh, division amongst integers. Hard problems are things like discrete logarithm and computational Diffie-Hellman. And now we want to set things up so that we have cryptography where scheme algorithms use the easy problems, but the adversary to break these schemes is somehow faced with solving the hard problems. But all this needs a setup, which is that it's all taking place within groups, often defined by prime numbers. For security, these prime numbers need to be very big and of specific forms. And so we have the question of how do we find effectively all these numbers and parameters? And uh, how do we put them into our system so that we can actually get going with all of this? So if you look um, how this is done in practice, you'll see that often these parameters are, are chosen and then made uh, available in some public way. So for example, here are some common groups in a, in a Java um, library. So it will show you here's a 512-bit prime. Here's a generator of the group ZP star. For 768 bits, here's a prime and a generator, and, go, and so on. Um, there are a few such choices. Here it discusses the Oakley groups, but we can also look at that more directly. These are the Oakley primes, and there are similarly some elliptic curve groups. And um, it'll, it'll tell you exactly what the primes are. Here they actually have formulas. The prime is this formula and here's its decimal representation and it has been rigorously verified as a prime and then they will tell you that the generator is actually two and uh, the then there's a larger primes of this form and so forth so clearly people are able to uh, find and fix these groups and for the most part the internet security protocols tend to use these fixed groups. But we are interested in the problem here now of how we do all this. There's still some algorithmic questions there, particularly if you want to build your own groups, which is often a, a good idea. So um, let's make that a little more concrete. Let's say I want to build a ZP star type group. That means I need a prime number P of the right form to make the discrete log problem hard which means both a certain structure and a certain size, and a generator of ZP star. Now, it would be nice if we simply had formulas that in general could return prime numbers and generators. But uh, despite interest in this from mathematicians for a long time, nobody seems to have found uh, general such formulas. One can see um, questions about that. So for example, Here's someone asking, is there an, an explicit formula to find a generator of a cyclic group? And um, we see some answers, and um, maybe we'll get back to this when we get to generators. So the strategy that people use then is that they pick numbers at random and test them until they get a prime. And similarly, in the absence of a formula for generators, once you have a prime, you pick elements of ZP star at random and test them until you have a generator. But even this requires solving a few problems. How do we do these tests? We need a test for whether a number is a prime. If you want random choices of numbers to give you a prime in a reasonable amount of time, it must be the case that primes are relatively dense. There should be a good enough probability that a random number is prime. To estimate that, we need to answer questions like how many numbers in a given range are primes and of the desired form. And exactly the same questions for generators. 
how do you test if a group element is a generator and how many generators are there so that you know the probability that a randomly chosen group element gives you a generator. So let's look at these a little bit. One reason it's interesting is they make nice connections with classical number theory and even historically have been a source of um, synergy between algorithms, computer science research, and, uh, and number theory. So here's how we aim to find primes. We'll usually start with a desired bit length for the prime because the bit length is the main determinant of security. But also we've seen that the structure of the prime matters and a simple way to get a prime relative to which the discrete log problem is hard for all known algorithms is to have it of the form twice another prime plus one or put another way p minus one over two should also be a prime. So here's our algorithm. It takes the security parameter integer k. It picks random numbers which have bit length k. So that means in this range until that number is a prime and also p minus one over two is prime. So doing this then raises these two questions we mentioned earlier. How do we do these primality tests? And how many iterations does it take to succeed? Which comes down to what is the probability that this number p is prime? So primality testing is a classic problem. Uh, and here's how we might try to do it. Input an integer n. I want an algorithm that returns true if n is prime and false otherwise. It's quite easy to write this. Just trial division. Try all possible divisors starting from 2. You can stop at about the square root of n because if there's any non-trivial divisor, there's one smaller than that. Test whether i divides n, meaning n mod i is 0. If it does, then n is composite, return false. And if all these test divisions fail, we return true. And we've seen this kind of Thing before and by now we know what the issue is. This works but it's too slow. If you're looking for primes which are thousands of bits long or two to the thousands in magnitude, clearly this is not going to work. This is an exponential time algorithm. Now this was known for a long time and people sought a faster algorithm. In the 60s when uh, the study of randomized algorithms started. One of the really interesting examples that was found was a randomized algorithm to test primality. This algorithm was very fast. It was polynomial time. It was cubic time in the length of the number being provided. And being randomized, it had a tiny chance of giving the wrong answer. But given that you could make that tiny as tiny as you wanted, in practice, it really wasn't too much of an issue. So this was important both from the point of view of theory of algorithms to show the power of randomized algorithms, but also for getting cryptography off the ground in practice. Now, the search as a theoretical question for whether primality is in P continued and eventually, surprisingly, a deterministic polynomial time algorithm was found. Uh, its running time at the time was n to the 8. I think it's now down to about length of n to the 6th. But in any case, it's it's much slower than this. So in practice, it's not used for, for cryptography. But this is an interesting evolution in the theory of algorithms. So that answers one of our questions. The next one is, if I'm drawing primes, uh, drawing numbers at random, what is the chance that I get a prime? This is something mathematicians have studied for a long time in classical number theory. They have a function pi of n that returns the number of primes in the range 1 through n. So if we pick a number at random in the range 1 through n, the probability it's prime is just pi of n over n. So once I know how pi of n grows with n, I can estimate this probability and thus the number of iterations my algorithm will take to succeed. It turns out that pi of n is asymptotically grows as n over log n. Or in other words, about a 1 in log n fraction of numbers are prime. So 
when so probability p is prime is about one in log n. Now this is actually quite high. For example, if n is at two to the thousand twenty four, then you have about a one in thousand chance that a random number is prime. So the number of iterations taken by our algorithm to find a prime is not too big on a on a reasonable computer. This is cheating a little bit because we were picking numbers in an interval, not between 1 and n, but uh, similar things hold there as well. So again, kind of a nice connection with uh, some of the most classical results of classical number theory. Okay, so the next question was, now where we have a prime, I need a generator of the group CP star. And uh, again, we could ask for a formula and now I think I'll go back to that web page where someone did ask for that. And um, it's interesting to see that here's an answer using a bit of algebra. The claim is that um, all elements except one are generators due to some uh, result, which is basically just that anything to the power of the order of the group is one. But as someone else points out, this is actually not true. And they gave a correct answer that if you start with a generator, you can get another generator by raising to any power which is relatively prime to p minus 1 and thereby estimate the number of generators at this formula. So um, so, so quite a bit is known about, um, about generators in that way. Okay, so um, it's not in, in general easy to find a generator but it turns out that if you know the factorization of the group order, which is here p minus 1, then it's quite easy. And uh, so the actual algorithm then comes down to pick group elements at random. You can exclude one since it's not a generator and test them as you get them until you find a generator. And so we need to design the testing procedure and figure out the probability that points are generators when drawn randomly from the group. So we could do this in general, but usually we like primes which are also have the structure that p minus 1 is twice a prime so that the index calculus methods for finding discrete logarithms are uh, the best possible as far as we know. Primes of that form are called Sophie Germain primes, which are abbreviated by SG. Um, Sophie Germain was a, is a well-known mathematician. You can see something about her here. Uh, she was uh, born in an era of revolution. So her interest in mathematics began during the French Revolution when she was 13 years old. And she started reading books and discovering them and uh, had an illustrious career and um, uh, worked with Gauss and with other well-known mathematicians. And I believe that Sophie Germain primes come up in her results about Fermat's last theorem. She gave some important results about that. <clears throat> As an example, 7 is a Sophie Germain prime because 7 minus 1 is 2 times a prime. Okay, so um, let's go through an example to see how we might discover generators in the group of integers modus Sophie Germain prime. So let's look at z star 7. So let's just raise elements in z star 7 to powers and see what happens. Obviously 1 to any power is 1. Let's try 2. 2 to the power 1 is 2. 2 to the power 2 is 4. 2 to the power 3 is 8, which is 1 mod 7, and so on. So then we can do it with 3, and we have fast ways of doing this too, but um, we've studied those before. Okay, how from this can we tell what the generators are? Well, we know that too. The definition of a generator is, is that its powers cover everything in the group. So here we certainly don't. Here we don't. We see that 4 occurs twice and 3 never occurs. Here. Do we see everything in the group? One, two, three, four, five, six. Yes. So three is a generator. Four is not. Is five a generator? Yes. One, two, three, four, five, six. And six is not. So empirically, easy enough to see three and five are generators. 
Now let's see if we can see some structure there. So I claim that by looking at this table, we might see a pattern, something that tells us what, how we can determine whether something is a generator faster than raising it to all powers and looking at the results. And the claim is only a couple of columns in this table matter. Although it appears that we had to look at the results in all columns, I claim only two columns matter, which are the columns two and three. Raising to powers two and three uniquely identifies the generators. How does it do that? Consider raising all these numbers to these two powers. For the generators, we never see a one. For non-generators, there's always a one somewhere. Okay. And that's it. That turns out to be a good rule. So g is a generator if and only if neither g squared nor g cubed is a 1 in this particular example. And that's if and only if. This generalizes if p is a Sophie-Jean main prime, so it has the form twice another prime, then the test is that raise g to the power 2, square it, you should not get 1 raise g to the power q, this prime over here, uh, mod p, that should also not be 1. Note it's easy to compute these by modular exponentiation algorithms. And as long as these two small tests return non-1 values, we're guaranteed that g is a generator. And you can see that the savings is, is enormous. p might be of a magnitude 2 to the 1024. The number of possible exponents you would need to test if you tried everything is entirely prohibitive, something like 2 to the power 1024. But we are saying here you actually only need to test two exponents. And you see that this matches our example. When p is 7, q is 3, and that is what we had. Now if you're interested in the more general fact, when p is not a Sophie Germain prime but general, what you do is you look at the prime factorization of the group order, which is p minus 1. So write p minus 1 as a product of prime powers. For example, for p equals 7, we would write 6 as 2 to the power 1 times 3 to the power 1. So once you've done this, look at the numbers formed by dropping 1 prime uh, one, 1 by 1 each one from this expression. In other words, divide p minus 1 by p1 to get s1. Divide p minus 1 by s2 to get by p2 to get s2 and so forth. This gives you n numbers. n here is the number of different primes in the prime factorization of p minus 1, which is small. And g is a generator if and only if when you raise it to these powers, you don't get back 1. right? So in here, n is 2, and so those are those two powers. So it generalizes is quite nicely. OK, we've solved the first problem. We know how to test easily if something is a generator. Now we need to know in uh, ZP star how many generators are there, because that'll tell us the likelihood of hitting one when we pick points at random. So um, the fact is that for a Sophie Germain prime, so p minus 1 is twice another prime, there are q minus 1 generators, which is a lot. It's, it's quite dense in the group. So for example, um, when p is 7, there are two generators. Again, we can ask what happens in general. And the answer is that if p is an arbitrary prime, the number of generators of zp star is the Euler phi function phi applied to the order of zp star, which is p minus 1. And that little page we saw previously is effectively telling us that formula. With this, it's quite easy to compute the probability that this loop finds a generator in a trial. And that would be the number of generators in zp star divided by the number of choices for g here, which is 1 less than the group size. So for a Sophie Germain prime, that would be q minus 1 over 2q minus 1, or about a half. So we expect, in fact, for this algorithm to terminate in, in just about two trials. Okay.
And now with all that, I claim that if we come back to where we started, to the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, it should make a ton more sense and we kind of would understand everything that was put into this algorithm. So recall the algorithm. We fixed a large prime P in a generator of ZP star. We now know what that means. Alice picks a random exponent. We now know that the reason P minus one is here is because it's the order of ZP star and raises G to the power little x to get big X and communicates that. Bob does likewise with the y's. And then they look at g to the power little x little y, which we've studied as part of the computational Diffie-Hellman problem. And they use the algebra, which shows that both this formula and this formula are computed. And so they have their joint key. We had started off by asking a bunch of problems. How do we pick a large prime? And uh, how large is enough? Well, we just studied how we pick prime numbers. How large is enough? Well, we studied how discrete log algorithms fare as a function of the size of the prime, and we use that to estimate. What did it mean for G to be a generator? We've given that definition. Powers of G recover all group elements. How do we find a generator? That was the last thing we studied. Pick things at random, run our test algorithms, and we know the probability of success. How can Alice and Bob compute what they need? We have that answer too, it's modular exponentiation. Why is it hard for the adversary to break this? It's, well, we haven't given a lot of insight about that, but we know that it corresponds to solving the computational Diffie-Hellman problem. And we believe that that's um, infeasible computationally. And so with that, we've kind of managed to understand one of the gems of uh, cryptography, the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, and we'll be able to leverage this um, as we move on. So cryptography in general, and the part based on number theory in particular, relies on two pillars. The first is problems that are computationally easy. These are the problems which algorithms in our schemes will solve in order to perform encryption and decryption operations quickly. The second is problems that are computationally hard, and we arrange that to violate security, the adversary will be faced with those. And so cryptography is concerned with the search for these hard computational problems. In the number theory domain, we've seen one example, which is the discrete log problem. It did come in a few different flavors. And we now turn to the second or another example, which is the very classic RSA system. So let n be a integer and consider the group Zn star. In our study of the discrete log, n was a prime, but in RSA, it will be a composite. Recall that phi of n is the size or order of this group. Now, phi of n is itself an integer, and so I can look at the group of integers mod phi of n and relatively prime to phi of n. In that group, let's say I pick a number e. Now, since it is a group, there is another number d, which is its inverse, e times d mod phi of n will be 1. So let d be that number. With those fixed in this new group, let us return to the original group cn star and take an arbitrary point x in that group. Let us raise x to the power e, this number over here, and raise the result to the power d, all modulo n, which means we're working in the higher level group. The claim says that what we get back is just x itself. Intuitively, or when we start using this for an application, this step is encryption, encrypting x, and this is decrypting the result. But at the moment, that doesn't concern us. We're just looking at the math, and the math is this equation. The proof of verifying this is quite easy. If you compute this, this becomes x to the power e times d. However, we remember that whenever you're working in any group, here the group is z n star, exponents can always be taken modulo the order of the group. 
and the order of the group here is phi of n. So I can throw in a mod phi of n here for free. And now I notice that ed mod phi of n is 1, and so the result of this is x to the 1, which is x. There is another way to formulate this, mathematically identical, but a little closer to encryption in terms of how we can think about it. So let's say we have again this number n, which we call a modulus, and a number e, which is in z star phi of n, which we call an encryption exponent. These give rise to a function that takes inputs in z n star and returns outputs in the same stead. And the function is simply defined as on input x, return x to the e mod n. Now suppose I have a value d in z star phi of n, which is the inverse of e in that group, so that e times d mod phi of n is 1. I call that the decryption exponent corresponding to e. And based on that, I can, de I can define another function, also from z n star to z n star, which on input y raises y to the dth power mod n. What the claim says is those two functions are inverses of each other. And also, both are permutations on z n star. They're one to one on two functions, and they reverse each other. What does that mean? Well, it's quite easy to, to check. It just says that if I compute f on some point x in z n star, and then compute f inverse, I should get back x. And of course, that's true just by our prior claim f of x is x to the e mod n, and when we take f inverse, we're raising to the d, so we get back x. But now we kind of think of the f function as encrypting plain text x, and we think of the f inverse function as decrypting ciphertext y. This is not a perfect analogy, but when we start studying encryption, it'll at least be a starting point. So let's illustrate these things numerically. So suppose n was 15, which is a composite, 3 times 5. z star n, we know how to get that. We just look at all numbers between 1 and 14 and throw away multiples of 3 and 5. And so here's what we're left with. What is phi of n? It's this number of points in here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So now we can look at z star phi of n. That's all numbers between 1 and 7 which have no common divisor with 8. So we throw out all the even numbers, we're left with 1, 3, 5, 7. So we draw inputs or messages from z and star, exponents from here. So let's take some encryption exponent. We can pick anything in here, and here we pick 3. We now need to find the corresponding decryption exponent, which is something which satisfies that e times d mod 8 is 1. Playing around, it turns out that d is 3 also, because 3 times 3 is 9, mod 8 is 1. A bit unfortunate for an example, but it takes a rather large value of n to get beyond that, so we stay with this. The first function f is now cubing mod 15, and the inverse function, which we'll write g here, happens to also be that. But this is x to the e, this is y to the d. And we see how it plays out if I take any x and z and star, meaning now I consider these elements and write them all down here. If I apply f of x, I'm cubing mod 15, and you can see how it works. So 1 cubed is 1, 2 cubed is what? 2 squared is 4, 4 times 2 is 8. And then you keep going like that. Now apply g to what's here. So again, you're cubing mod 15, 1 cubed is 1, you have to compute 8 cubed mod 15, it turns out the result is 2, and so forth. And so the claims are simply pointing out that the first and third columns are identical. You've just recovered x by this process. So here's a few exercises which ask you to play with encryption and decryption exponents. So from the cryptographic point of view, we call RSA a one-way trapdoor permutation. What does that mean? It means that we expect or hope that computing this inverse function is going to be difficult unless you have knowledge of a certain secret called the trapdoor. The trapdoor is the decryption exponent, 
We know you can easily compute F inverse if you have it, but we are also going to argue that at least for properly chosen parameters, it's hard to compute F inverse when you don't know D, and that's the one-wayness property. Now, we said here that this is true for appropriately chosen parameters, so we do need to start looking at how they're chosen, which the math didn't talk about. And that task is usually handed to an algorithm called an RSA generator, which picks the parameters. There are many ways to design these generators. So rather than trying to specify one, we will give a kind of broad definition, which says that an RSA generator is an algorithm which outputs five things satisfying certain properties. It has associated to it an integer k called the security parameter. And as the name indicates, the larger this is, the more security you expect you're getting. Think of it for the moment as thousands of bits. So what are these numbers? P and Q are supposed to be distinct odd primes. N is simply their product, and we call that the RSA modulus. We require that the bit length of N be the security parameter K. If you want to write that in numbers, it means n is in the range 2 to the k minus 1 up to 2 to the k. E is the encryption exponent. It must be in z star phi of n. D, the decryption exponent, is also in z star phi of n. And they're required to be inverses of each other, so E d mod phi of n is 1. Now, there are many algorithms, of course, that satisfy these properties. And not all of them will be security-wise desirable. So we should, at some point, we will get to some suggestions for ones that, are, that work well, as far as we know. As we approach both the design of RSA generators and the study of RSA security, it's useful to know a little bit more of, about the math concerning phi of n. So one fact is the following. If when we've so far needed to figure out what phi of n was, we've done it by enumerating the elements in the group Zn star, and then counting how many there were. But there's actually a formula that makes it easier. If I know that n is a product of distinct primes p and q, then phi of n is actually p minus 1 times q minus 1. So for example, in our prior example, when n was 15, it factors as 3 times 5. And then we could immediately conclude that phi of 15 is 3 minus 1 times 5 minus 1, which is 2 times 4, which is 8, which is indeed what we had before. Sometimes it's worthwhile knowing that this fact is more general. We can, in fact, compute phi on numbers that are not merely the product of two primes, but arbitrary. How do we do that? We first factor the number. We obtain the prime factorization, meaning we write it as a product of p sub i to the alpha sub i, where these are primes and these are integer powers. And every number, as you know, can be uniquely written like that. If so, the formula for phi of n is given over here. Take each prime, reduce its power by 1, multiply by the prime minus 1, and go down the list. And if you plug it in, you'll see that the prior fact is just a special case of this. As an example, take a number like 45. It's not a product of two primes is 3 squared times 5 to the 1. The fact says that phi of that is this, 3 to the 1 times 2, and then here you get 5 to the 0 times 4, it works out to 24. Also recall that we have this mod inverse algorithm. So if I have a point E in Z star phi of n, I can easily compute its inverse. How do I do that? I know that it's the inverse in the group, and the mod inverse algorithm says if I give you, if you give me e and uh, phi of n, I will return the d such that e times d is 1 mod phi of n. It's important to remember here that this algorithm takes not just e as input, but also phi of n. That we'll see why that matters later. Also remember, we've seen algorithms to efficiently test primality and we know that random numbers have a pretty good chance of being prime. So these become things we can use in the design of RSA generators. Okay, here's just one example of an RSA generator. There are many more. 
but at least we can write this down. In this case, we're going to target having an encryption exponent of 3. Why is that? Because the smaller is the encryption exponent, we will see later the more efficient is encryption. So we call this generator this to denote that 3 will always be the encryption exponent. And it has a security parameter that we assume is even. How does it work? Well, we have to find primes and set the modulus n to their product. But for security, we want these primes to be random and of roughly the same size. So we pick primes, which are approximately k over 2 bits long. But of course, we can't pick them directly. What we actually do is we pick random numbers, approximately k over 2 bits long, and then create the candidate modulus and the candidate value of phi of n, which now we know would be this formula. And we just repeat that until everything works. That means that the p's and q's really are prime, which we know how to test for, that um, e really is in z star phi of m, which means the GCD of e and this quantity must be 1, and that n falls within the desired range, which is given by this check. And we know that this is going to happen reasonably quickly. Once it does, the last thing we need is d, but our prior algorithm gives us that. We just take the modular inverse of e with phi of n, and we return these, these five quantities. Good, so we know how to build RSA generators. Now we can start studying the security of RSA. The property we're interested in is one-wayness. What that means is, if I give you the modulus encryption exponent, and some point y in the range, which you think of as obtained, as applying f to some point x in the domain, then it should be hard to find x. So of the parameters for RSA, remember there was n, p, q, e, and d, only two appear here, the modulus and the encryption exponent. The algorithm trying to invert RSA is denied the other parameters because those are the trapdoor and some x was chosen in some way. f of x is just x to the e mod n that was computed. It's given y and asked to find x. That's the informal version. When we formalize it, we need to worry about how x is chosen and how these n and e are chosen. So what emerges in the formalism is when we talk about one-wayness of RSA, what we really mean is one-wayness of a particular RSA generator. So the game in definition are parameterized by a choice of generator. And once we have that, initialize runs it over here to get those five parameters. Now knowing n, it picks a random x as the target from Zn star and applies the RSA function, meaning raises x to the eth power mod n. And then the adversary is given as challenge, the modulus, the encryption exponent, and this y value and the p and q and d are never used. What the adversary has to do is compute on this, eventually return to the game or output some x prime that it thinks equals x. And the game checks if it got it right. Have you inverted uh, the function f at the point y? And if so, the game returns true. As usual, when you run the game with an adversary, there's some probability it returns true, and we call that the advantage. This adversary is denoted i, not a as usual. i stands for inverter. So that appears in the superscript here and the argument here. O, w for one-wayness. And again, this is a property of the generator that we're measuring. So now we know what we want from RSA. We can start thinking about whether we are getting it. So if you were an attacker, how would you try to violate one-wayness? Well, someone would hand you the modulus encryption exponent and a point y, and your task is to find an x such that y is the inverse of x, which means if I raise x to the eth power, I should get back y mod n. Well, we know that if I have the decryption exponent d, this task is very easy because the entire mathematical basis of RSA is that I can recover x as y raised to the power of the decryption exponent mod n. Remember the decryption exponent was, was chosen to satisfy this. 
satisfying ED mod phi of n is 1. That says I can now simplify my cryptanalytic task. All I really need is to find D. In particular, I really don't care about Y anymore. I only look at N and E and try to find D. Okay, things are looking better. So now I notice they get better still. There's actually a formula for D. All I have to do is compute the modular inverse function on E and phi of N. And I know that the modular inverse function is fast. So that means I should be able to compute D, right? Yes, but there's a caveat. I need the phi of N part. I need both inputs to run this function over here. Okay, but things are still getting simpler and simpler. For example, I no longer care about E even. I only need to focus on N and figure out what phi of N is. But then we remember we even have a formula for phi of N. It's P minus 1 times Q minus 1, where N is P times Q. So I could compute phi of N. All I need is to know the primes P and Q such that N equals P times Q. Well, they weren't given to me, so that is my kind of main task. How do I go from the modulus N to the two primes that make it up? Well, and that's where we hit a bit of a snag. That's called a factoring problem, and uh, let's study it. If you can factor, we have seen that we can invert RSA. Now, security is going to rely on whether or not the adversary can invert RSA. So it's worth noting that we don't know whether the converse is true, meaning potentially there are ways to invert RSA that bypass factoring the modulus, but none such is particularly known. So from a practical perspective, it comes down to trying a way to factor the modulus. Okay, let's study factoring. How well can we do? As with many problems in number three we've seen, it's very easy to write down a factoring algorithm. The simple one here says take a number n, for simplicity a product of two primes, and simply try all possible divisors. You can stop at the square root of n, because if anything divides n, there's something smaller than that that does. Check whether i, the candidate divisor, divides n by checking if n mod i is zero. And if so, you're done. One That divisor is one of the primes, and n divided by i is the other. So that's fine mathematically. The problem is, of course, is that the running time is on the order of the square root of n, the number you're trying to factor, which is exponentially large in the bit length of n, which is what we're really concerned with. You can write it like this, a bit of a notational uh, w's here. E here is 2.7, the base of the natural log, not the RSA encryption exponent. But then is that raised to the power about half of the natural log of n? And the bit length of n is roughly the natural, it's the log base 2 of n, so close to the natural log of n. So this is exponential in the bit length. And of course, if you think about it pragmatically, if I have, for example, a just a number of magnitude about 2 to the 256, then this takes time 2 to the 128 and is completely out of reach. Okay, now again, as with the study of discrete log, we shouldn't stop there. Since security relies on whether or not the adversary can factor n, it behooves us to try a little bit harder. Are there better algorithms than the naive? And just like for discrete log, there actually are. There's something called the quadratic sieve, whose running time is something like this, uh, base of the natural log to the power natural log of n square root, and then double times the natural log, and again a square root with some constant in front. The, another later algorithm, the number field sieve, improves this by substituting the square root with a cube root. This factor is less important. The constant is about 1.92. Now these algorithms are what are called sub these running times are what are called sub-exponential, meaning it's not polynomial time, but it's not fully exponential either due to these square and root and cube roots. And these make significant difference. So if you want to know how well these algorithms perform, not only because the running time formulas are kind of complicated, but because 
implementation matters so much, you have to go and implement them and do experiments. And the way that plays out is that um, challenges are posted out there and monetary rewards are offered uh, sometimes at least for people who can factor them. And so we see how good people have been at factoring. So if you go back to the 90s, a 400-bit number at that point was factored with the quadratic set. Now at that point, the idea was that 512-bit numbers are good and you have security with that. So through the 90s, we saw improvements and a dramatic one when the number field sieve arrived and that allowed us to uh, go further to the point where something which at the time was very surprising happened, which is numbers even larger than 512 bits were in fact effectively factored. And this led the internet to go into a frenzy and change all their numbers. And since then there's been dramatic progress. So you see that in a few years they upped it to 576. By 2009, 700 odd bits, almost 800 in 2019 and by 2020, over 800 bits. One must remember that as these bit lengths increase even a little, the sub-exponential running times increase a lot. But with appropriate implementations and all kinds of um, other efforts, they managed to do this. So where are we now? We estimate that the 1024-bit RSA modulus provides about 80 bits of security, meaning factoring it would take about 2 to the 80 time. And however, even if that seems kind of out of reach at present, the recommendation is to go to even longer modular like 2048 bits. And indeed, if you look at um, certificates and, and uh, things like that, they do go to bit lengths like this. In practice, some choices of the encryption exponent seem to have become canonical. For example, E equals 3 or 17 or 65,537. So when we ask why are these choices made, and the clue comes when we look at the binary expansion of these integers, and what we notice is they're minimal in the number of ones. So there are ones at the beginning and end and everything else is a zero. So why would you prefer this? The reason is it reduces costs for modular exponentiation to the minimal possible. So recall when we studied the modular exponential algorithm that if you want to compute x to the e -th power mod n given x e and n, you go through the binary expansion of the exponent e and you do a certain number of operations per bit in that binary expansion. The number of operations which we do not see of b here depends on the value b of the bit. And it's if you look back at the algorithm, it's one modular exponentiation if that bit is a zero and two if that bit is a one. So the fewer the number of ones in the binary expansion, the faster is modular exponentiation. And since this is a central operation and encryption and signature verification, we like to make it as fast as possible. Now we've discussed some attacks on RSA and focused mainly on, on factoring as the main threat. There are other attacks. So if you are listed here, Copper Smiths, the Franklin Ryder attack, the Hustal attack, these are all very interesting and clever, but they work for small encryption exponents. Now, at first that may suggest to us that, well, we should avoid small encryption exponents like E equals three, but that's not necessarily true these attacks don't violate the basic formal notion of one-wayness that we have targeted as our main goal for RSA. And when we design public encryption and digital signature schemes that use RSA, we will do that in careful ways that ensure that their security is tied to the one-wayness assumption in RSA. And as, as, as a result, these alternative attacks end up not actually being a threat there, but still good to be aware of in many settings and a good lesson to avoid naive and direct use of RSA.
All right, so going forward when we use RSA, here are the points to remember. When we fix the encryption exponent E modulus and N and corresponding decryption exponent D, we define a function f from z n star to z n star, which on input x raises it to the eth power mod n. And we refer to that as a trapped or one-way permutation, or think of it that way. And what that means is that it's easy, given n, e, and x, to compute f of x. That's just modular exponentiation algorithm. It's also easy to reverse the computation if you know the trapdoor d, because that operation simply takes y and our value of f of x and raises it to the dth power mod n. But if you're denied the trapdoor and you're simply given f of x and asked what is x, it's hard to figure that out. This is true formally when x is randomly chosen from z n star. So we've seen a few sources of hard problems for cryptography, one from the discrete log side, the other being the RSA system. There's been a lot of excitement and advances more recently based on another type of hard problems. These come from bilinear maps. So let's briefly look at that setup. We're going to have two groups. G and GT, the T stands for target. They're both cyclic and they have the same order that we'll denote by M. We have a function E that takes two inputs, both in the first group G and returns an output in the target group. And we want to say what it means for it to be bilinear. To do that, we're going to fix a generator of the first group. Any choice is fine here. So bilinearity means that if you consider E operating on G to the X and G to the Y, it's the same as if you operated with E on G and G and raise the result to the power of the product X and Y. Remember that both these outputs are in the target group. And this has to be true for all exponents. There's another requirement arising out of the fact that there's a trivial, uninteresting way to achieve this which is to have E send everything to the identity element of the target group. But we insist that E of G and G is a generator of the target group, and then it becomes quite non-trivial. Building groups and bilinear maps with these properties is not that simple, and we're not going to go into exactly how that's done, but we'll use it abstractly. In most users, the group order is a prime number. Notice that bilinearity implies that if I want to take the pairing or bilinear map applied to g to x and g to the y, I can shuffle the exponents around. I can move the y here and the x over here. That follows easily from this property. So now what about hard problems in this setting? Well, we still have groups and so the old discrete log and computational Diffie-Hellman problems still make sense and can be considered in either group. And we do aim to build these groups such that these problems are hard. Now, another problem is what's called decision Diffie-Hellman. There you're given two points in a group, let's say the first group, big X and big Y, the first being g to the little x and second being g to the little y. And rather than having to compute g to the power little x, y, you're given a candidate value z for it and asked, is that candidate value correct or not? Now, in standard groups of the type we studied before, it may not be easy to perform such a check. But when you have a bilinear map, it becomes easy because all you have to do is check that e applied to x and y is the same as e applied to the generator and z. Why is that? because all that really matters is the product of the exponents of g. So in both cases, that product is x times y. This is going to be useful in some of the uses of bilinear maps. And we also have a new hard problem, which we'll call bilinear Diffie-Hellman. So what does that look like? Let's fix the setup from the prior slide. We have our bilinear map uh, with the two associated groups and a generator of the first group. In this game, initialize starts by picking some exponents at random. 
In computational Diffie-Hellman, we would pick two, pick two of them. Here we pick three. And we generate from them not just two group elements, but three of them, and return all three to the adversary. The adversary's job is similar to computational Diffie-Hellman. It has to compute something to the product of the exponents, except now there are three exponents, and the something in the base is not G itself, but the bilinear map on G and G. In other words, we are asking this be done in the target group. And remember that this was a generator of the ladder. So the adversary simply gets these inputs, wins if it provides an output equal to this value. It has some probability of winning, and that's its advantage in the BDH metric. Good, so now we have quite a lot of tools and we'll be exploiting them heavily going forward. Now, one needs to point out kind of the elephant in the room with regard to the hardness of the problems we studied, which is that if it were possible to develop quantum computers, then there's an algorithm due to Shore, which can compute discrete logarithms and also factor integers in polynomial time. And in particular, it can break all the systems that we've studied here. Whether quantum computers can be built, and if so, how long it will take, is not something we understand too well at this moment. And there's quite a range of speculations on that. But nonetheless, cryptographers do try to be prepared for this. And there are other choices of computational problems, ones on lattices and codes, for which there are currently no known polynomial time quantum algorithms.